Hello everyone. Just launched the crawd out at a new lake. I've ice fished here before, but I've never fished in open water, so gotta figure them out. And this is what I would call the beginning of the fall transition. There's a few leaves that are starting to change on shore. Some of the swamp maples are starting to turn color. And what I'm doing is just checking shallow first. I've got a swim jig on. That's a Queen's Tackle swim jig with a D Walker 120 trailer. And I'm popping it through the reeds, I'm popping it through the lily pads, I'm popping it through the weeds. Every once in a while I still snag, but that's alright. Just rip them free and cast out again. Just to see if anybody's home. A lot of it looks good. Like I said, there's some reeds and grass all along the shoreline. There's lily pads, there's, uh, there's weeds under the water that you can't see. And there's a bunch of floating logs or stumps. Makes me think that they used to have some logging here and they would use the pond uh, to store logs or to float logs. And every once in a little while those logs will sink and then a hundred years later they float back up. So you gotta be pretty careful navigating around this pond so you don't run into one of those logs but, you know, the crawdad only has an electric motor, so I'm going pretty slowly. Plus, I'm fishing. I'm not buzzing around, uh, you know, dragging somebody in a tube or something. So I'm just working my way around, seeing if I can find any active fish shallow. Casting at all kinds of vis visible structure. It all looks pretty good. Try tighter to the bank. I'm a little offshore now. During the fall transition, uh, as soon as those weeds start to die, the fish tend to reposition. Sometimes they suck up into hard cover like logs, sticks, laydowns, trees, docks. Um, other times they, they move offshore. Um, and generally that's wherever there's bait. So it could be panfish schools, it could be herring, it could be shiners, it could be, you know, whatever it is the bass in your lake eat, they generally like to stick with the food. So if the food moves offshore, that's where the bass are going to be. If the food moves inshore, that's where the bass are going to be. It's not a 100% rule, but if, if you're not finding them shallow, typically I look for them offshore first. I picked up a, a casting jig to fish those pieces of wood there. There's a tree laying out in the water. And I can fish that casting jig a little bit slower than I can the swim jig. I'm trying to spinnerbait. I got a little wind blowing inshore here. Not a ton, but a little bit of a ripple. And I'm just I'm just searching for anything. The water is pretty stained so I can't see into it too well. So I'm using lures to to uh, to search search for me to see if I can run into any fish. That spinnerbait's running a little crooked so I'm trying to straighten it out as I'm fishing here and I'm, I haven't got it quite right. Back to the casting jig. You can see I'm running up on one of those logs right now. There's a couple of them, you know, there's like a tripod of them right, right there too. And I feel like I'm making decent casts into them and I feel like if there's fish holding on those pieces of hard cover, I'd run into them. You know, they might not be on every piece of hard cover, but you know, if they were on those logs, I should run into them by now. There's a bunch of those logs floating around too. There's got to be at least a dozen of them, maybe more like 20. We'll run up on this log right here and I'll slow it down. So you can see it's just kind of suspended there. One end's 
sunk down in the water and there's just a little bit showing above the surface like an iceberg. And I fished all around there. And I couldn't find them. But I'm putting in the work here. And at a certain point, I kind of make the decision, you know what? I got to do something else. So I'm making my way to the other side of the pond and I'm fishing, fishing on the way there too, but just to keep the fish honest. But I'm making my way to the other side of the pond and then I'm going to let the wind blow me back across the pond. I don't have any electronics on the crawdad, so it's not like I have forward facing sonar on here to just, you know, spot them wherever they might be in the water column. I have to use lures to, to find them and search for them and hunt for them. So I got the crawdad on high or the trolling motor on high. And every once in a while I see one of those logs and I'll stop and fish it. And then cruise on up to the next piece of structure. Maybe it's a point, maybe it's a log, maybe it's some weeds that stick out, or maybe it's a tree. And then fish that. It's another one of those logs. Just keeping those fish honest. Look at that crawdad go. I'm probably going all of three or four miles an hour. burning up the water here. You can actually cover a fair amount of water in a crawdad, so I kind of like fishing out of it, actually. Coming up on a, on a weedy point here. Throw the jig into that, too. Got a beaver lodge over here. Beaver lodges are good places to fish because they the beavers stack a bunch of sticks and and wood outside the lodge. And as long as there's no beavers, you know, uh, actively defending it, it's a good place to throw a couple casts into. All right, I've made my way offshore, and I'm gonna be fan casting with a chatterbait. This particular one is called a jackhammer. It's a very popular bait for a reason. It has a lot of thump, hence the name jackhammer. When you're holding the rod, it really feels like a mini jackhammer. And the fish can feel that thump on their lateral lines and they'll even come out of weeds. If they're buried in weeds, they'll come out of the weeds to smack that chatterbait. It's one of the chatterbaits with the most thump on the market. It's also one of the few chatterbaits that I can just take out of a package and fish with it. So to me, they're worth every penny. It's got a good snap, it's got a good hook, good components, good skirt, good hook keepers, and they just work. So again, I don't have any electronics on the crawdad. And so literally what I'm going to do is just fan cast that chatterbait around and see if I can locate pods of fish. Maybe they're in a certain depth or a certain kind of weed. There was a fish that just bumped me just then. And to me that's important. It says that there's fish offshore because I've already, I've only been out here a minute and I've already done better than the last half hour fishing shallow. And it just says there's potential out here. That one bump told me a lot. And now I just have to figure out what depth, what retrieve, what color, what profile, all that other stuff. But if I have some feedback, I can 
I can dial those things in. It's hard to dial in a pattern when you you just have nothing. You know, the fish just don't respond at all. So you got to find something that they respond to even a little bit. And then once you start hooking them, you can say, all right, I remember what I did then. I gave it a little pop right before that fish bit. Or they seem to like this color better, better than the next color. Maybe we should talk about some tips and tricks to, uh, to get the most out of your chatterbait fishing. It's not a bad fish. Good start. Finally got one in the boat. And I'm getting some feedback on fishing that chatterbait. So first tip on fishing chatterbaits is you want to fish in the wind. If you have a choice between fishing the calm side of a pond or a lake or the windy side, always pick the windy side. The wind is your friend when fishing a chatterbait. Uh, and if you have a day when there's no wind, there's probably another lure in your box that is a better choice. Uh, and this goes for fishing offshore or near shore or uh, ripping it through weeds. I always like to have some wind. It makes the fish less smart. It makes them a little bit more aggressive. It breaks up some of that flash um, if you have a gold or silver blade. And I just seem to do better when there's wind. So whenever I have a windy day, one of the first things I think of is picking up a chatterbait or a spinnerbait or a swim jig. They all seem to work better when there's wind. Tip number two is use the right rod. Now this is a case of do as John says and not as John does because I forgot my favorite chatterbait rod which is, uh, I'll list it below in the video description, but it's an arc rod made by Randall Farp and it's called the B Hite Special. I think that's for Brett Height. I'm not exactly sure, but it's a medium heavy, moderate fast rod and the butt of the rod is like a pool cue and it's got a vicious taper. The whole thing basically is a taper. I think it's a little bit thick because it's part glass or some blend, some graphite blend. Um, but it has the perfect action for fishing a chatterbait. I want enough horsepower to stick those fish and rip, rip uh, baits out of the grass. But I need a soft enough rod to, to bow up and keep those fish pinned. And that rod's just about perfect. The rod I'm fishing with is a Daiwa moderate action heavy power rod. It's a little bit soft even though it's a heavier power and um, it'll work but I feel like if I had my favorite rod with me I would have converted a few more of those bites. All right the next tip is to try to match your chatterbait profile to whatever bait are in your lake. So right now I'm trying to match golden shiners but it could be anything it could be perch it could be bluegill it could be crappy I've been on a bite where the fish were definitely keyed in on juvenile black crappy and that's what they wanted and so you had to match as close as you could to a black crappy in chatterbait form. But really it could be anything. Oof. I just missed one there. I feel like I'm not exactly dialed in. They're bumping it, but they're not really eating it. The next tip has to do with blade color. I feel like blade color is kind of a overlooked thing. But in stained water, I really like a gold blade. Now I'm fishing a golden shiner pattern, so a gold blade kind of makes sense. But even if I wasn't, say I was fishing a bluegill pattern, sometimes a gold blade in stained water really does well at attracting the fish. I feel like it carries further underwater uh, than a silver blade. And the fish just seem to respond to it better. 
So as a rule, I like gold blades in stained water and silver blades in, in clearer water and black blades kind of all around. I don't fish a lot of orange blades or painted blades because the water around me just isn't that muddy. But if you have muddy water, painted blades uh, can stand out in that really uh, silty, dirty water. And it'll get you a, a few more bites, especially in the spring. But I don't really have too much of that around me. The darkest water I have, most of it looks like this, stained tan and stained from the swamps. All right, next tip is startup speed. So some chatterbaits, especially ones with uh, say a split ring on the nose instead of the blade directly attached, the startup speed on those chatterbaits is, uh, is lacking. And sometimes chatterbait startup speed is key, especially if you're ripping it out of weeds or popping the bait just like I was there. As soon as you start reeling again, you want that blade to be kicking and hitting the head. And if it doesn't, or it takes you um, a couple feet to get that blade to engage properly, you know, the, you're already past the fish. The fish isn't gonna, gonna bolt another three feet to get your chatterbait. So another reason I like the jackhammer is the startup speed is excellent. Um, I've fished some other chatterbaits with a split ring on the nose and I don't like them nearly as much. And it's all because of startup speed. You waste a lot of your retrieve just getting that blade to respond the way it ought to. And, um, and I think you miss a bunch of fish doing it. Not that I'm not missing fish here. I keep getting bumps and not uh, hooking up, but I'm going to try to fix that in a, in a minute. All right, tip number six is to change up the retrieve. There's kind of two ways to do this. You can either purposely run into stuff. It could be weeds or old reeds or anything that you think you can force a chatterbait through and rip it out. Or you can pop it just while you're winding it in. And you kind of have to picture a fish looking at the bait, trying to decide if it wants to eat it or not. And when you pop it, that, that little change in motion, maybe it looks like the bait is trying to get away, or it's freaked out, or it realizes the fish is chasing it, and the fish tend to react doesn't work all the time but every once in a while I like to to mix in a pop just like that um, to help trigger those fish all right the next tip is if the full-size chatterbait isn't working or the fish are short striking you can try a smaller chatterbait like a mini max and that's what I've got on this rod right here uh, sometimes in the early, early spring, the water is still very cold. They won't hit a full-size chatterbait, uh, but they will hit a mini max. And it can make the difference between having a poor day and having a good day. Now, the reason I put on the mini max here is because I lost the wind. And it seems like that smaller profile, when there's not as much wind, I can sometimes get a few more bites than if I, uh, I was just fishing with a standard size chatterbait. You can also use a smaller trailer or a different trailer. Okay, that brings me to tip number eight, try a different trailer. So on the Minimax, I have a Z-Man Jerk Shads, one of the little ones, and it, it's a very durable bait because it's the Z-Man Elastec plastic. Uh, it works really well. And it just adds a little bit of bulk and a little bit of motion to the back of that that little mini max. And if uh, you know a perch pulls at it or something like that, it doesn't shred the trailer. Or a little pickerel gets at it, it holds up to all of those things. And th that's why I like it on the mini max. 
on the full-size chatterbait, the jackhammer, I've got a hog farmer spunk shad in a golden shiner type color. But they have a bunch of different colors and they did a collaboration with missile baits and they have some more colors. So those are my two main ones. Uh, but I will also mix it up with some other other trailers. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the Z-Man Jerk Shads. They also have uh, uh, Z-Man Razor Shads. That's pretty good too. And just depending on what kind of profile I like or I want to match. Usually it's some sort of bait fish profile. But every once in a while I want a crawfish trailer on the back of there or um, something with... A little bit more action to keep it above some weeds I'm trying to fish or more resistance in the water to keep it higher than uh, I'm currently fishing or maybe I want something very streamlined so I can get it a little bit deeper so you can play around with all these things that leads me to tip number nine if you really want to fish deeper one way to do that is with uh, a heavier chatterbait. They make them up to an ounce and a quarter now. And not many people fish them. I mean, the bulk of my fishing takes place in the 3 8 ounce and a half ounce range. But if you really want to get down and, and show the fish something that they don't see too much, a 3 quarter ounce or even an ounce and a quarter chatterbait will, um, will show those fish something that they, they just don't see a lot. Okay, last tip. If all else fails, and I'm getting a bunch of short strikes, so I know there's fish there, but I'm not converting them. I've tried the Mini Max. Maybe I've changed colors or sizes. I will add a trailer hook to my chatterbait. It can be a little bit tricky doing this because if you're on a good bite sometimes the fish can get that that chatterbait deep and you don't really want to injure them you don't want that trailer hook down their throat so I only do this when the fish are being fussy or slapping at the bait or you know I don't have ideal conditions or I don't have the right rod or you know this is kind of a last resort kind of a deal but it really can convert some of those fish that are just slapping at the bait and not really eating it. Usually I can figure them out if I have enough time. Um, and maybe, maybe it's a color thing or maybe it's a blade color thing or a profile and I'm just not quite dialed in. Um, but I don't have all my stuff with me and I don't have the time so I'm putting on that trailer hook. And pretty soon, I got one coming in the boat. This next fish was kind of a surprise. I didn't even know they were in here. Like I said, I've only ice fished here. I don't really know the pond very well. My first time fishing open water. Oh, look at that. And that's a black crappie. That's not a bad crappie. He ate it pretty well too. And that makes me think some of the fish that were just slapping at the full-size chatterbait, those could have been crappy. I know a few of them were bass. One of them was felt really solid. But there's at least one crappy in here, and where there's one, there's usually a few more. All right, I'm going to show you guys the knot I was using for the chatterbaits. It's called a trilene knot. Basically, you pass the line through the snap once, you do it again, so there's two loops. Wind the line up, the main line six times, 
six or seven times, and then you pass the line through the two loops, snug up that knot, wet it, set it the rest of the way, and it's done. So it's pretty easy not to tie. You can tie it in a rocking boat or wherever. One of the things I like about that knot is uh, the tag end sits flat against the snap. So that's important if you're ripping the bait through weeds. If the tag end sticks straight up or out, it'll tend to snag on uh, like algae and stuff and mess up the bait. Uh, with that knot, the tag end lays flat, or pretty flat. So it's not, not an issue. And um, yeah, so I put some of those tips I listed out earlier into use. I tried a heavier chatterbait. This one is a half ounce. I tried a different pattern and a black blade. And this time I'm trying to imitate, um, you know, kind of a bluegill sunfish pattern. And that fish seemed to like it as soon as I can get my hands on them. Yeah, so you see it's kind of a, a bluegill pattern. And um, they just weren't eating the golden shiner pattern all that well. And I lost the wind here. I'd already tried the mini max, and that wasn't really producing. So I thought I'd try, uh, you know, a, a different color and a different weight and see if I could get one more to go. And I got one more, and that was pretty much it. You know, as the wind faded, my chatterbait bite really just died out altogether, and it was never really hot. I mean, when they're when they're hot on a chatterbait, they will smoke it just one after another and you can really load the boat pretty fast. These fish weren't super fired up at all. Even though we've got some clouds, it was a post front day. So, I was happy to get a get a few fish and had a fun time on the water. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. So, thank you all for watching. I'll put uh, list all the baits and rods and lures and line and all that stuff that I was using in the video description. So you can check down there if you want to see what I was using. And then you can duplicate it on your own lake wherever you might live and hopefully have some success just like I had today. Alright, thanks again. I'll catch you on the next one. See ya!